You know, I think it started with me. I came back here and preached several years ago. Kathy and I have been back for a couple of years, and, and Sherman came home. That was, it was nice to hear the Lord say, hey, it's time to go home, pass the baton. And uh, so we came home, and it's awesome. And, you know, I, I preached maybe about a year or so before that. It had been so many years I got here. And then when they uh, introduced me to give a speak, these guys started clearing all the cables. I thought, man, that's awesome. They don't want the old guy tripping up here on the stage. That's all. I don't have to watch for all this stuff, you know. I, I can just walk back and forth and not trip over anything. Has anybody ever tripped over something like that? Yeah, come on now. I mean, tripped over a cord, you know, or, or, or you, you know, and over a rock or a stone. How, how many of you, I, I don't know if you want to lift your hands, how many of you tripped over your own two feet? <laughs> I saw someone in the ball game the other night did that. I don't feel. I said, "Man, you just lacked five yards." <laughs> okay, yeah, tripped over your own feet. You could have made it. We could have scored. I'm not telling you who it is, you know. But anyway, uh, you know, how many of you have just run into stuff too? It's like anybody that wears a cap knows what I'm talking about. Because sometimes you got that cap, and you look down, and you go, bam! It's like, oh my word, ow, you know, ow. Listen, you know, I, I grew up in the oil field and worked in the oil and gas industry for years. And, uh, and when I broke into the oil field while I was a young man and in college and stuff like that, uh, you know, there's so many wild things that went on back then. I mean, people were doing any and everything on these drilling rigs and just crazy stuff. I, I could uh, start on these stories and uh, Kathy come up here and jerk me off the stage. We'd be here all night. But... <laughs> You know, there's things that would do. I've had worked in one company. I remember working Derrick's, and, and you know, these, the deadline is what they call the deadline. It's the cable that goes up. That it, you know, Anyway, some of you know what I'm talking about. But it's a cable that goes up 100 foot in the air, more than 100 feet. And it's just this cable. And so when I got through running pipe, I just reached over and grabbed that cable, and I just ride it all the way down, about 90-something feet. And I went to work for a company called Sharp Drilling Company, and the tool pusher came immediately up there and said, we don't do that for Sharp Drilling Company. You do that again, you're out of here. And I said, okay, I'm not going to do that. But I started discovering, discovering that there's things I shouldn't be doing, you know, some crazy things that I saw a lot of guys running around without fingers and feet and toes and, you know, uh, got me to thinking. And there was a company that came into play back then called OSHA. And how many are familiar with OSHA now? Yeah, I'd never heard of it before then. I think that's when they just started really making money on us. But OSHA, Occupational Safety and Hazard uh, um, Huh? Safety and Health Administration. And so what they started doing is they could find companies for little things that they do and the wrong things that they do. They could, and really, it was, a, it was wonderful because it started saving lives. I've seen people killed on these drilling rigs and off and around and things that OSHA came in and started. What they started doing is getting the people on these drilling rigs and these companies and different companies of thinking for themselves thinking for themselves. You know, it didn't take me very long to trip over a couple of cords that I started looking for those cords, yeah. right? And uh, how many, you, you know, how many of you in your Christian walk, that's like a trip hazard. We call that cord a trip hazard, you know, and or other things that you might trip on as an old guy, you know, music equipment such as that. But how many of you have you've, you've found things in your Christian walk that you've tripped on? How many, how many, you know, after you got saved, you sinned? How many last week? No. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> I should have used yesterday or today, okay? You know, there's trip ha- the world is full of trip hazards. Honestly. And as Christians, the world we live in and the walk that we walk is full of trip hazards. We do things that we normally wouldn't do or say things we wish we hadn't said. Or, and what the Word of God and what God is trying to get us to do is to think about what we're doing before we do it. Uh, Amen. How many husbands, you've said something and suddenly, instantly, you wish you were were reaching for those words, but they're gone. It's too late. I'm going to pay a prize for that from my mouth. It doesn't take long on that to learn to think before you speak, right? But there's so many trip hazards in the walk that we walk. I mean, I could ask you all day just different things. How many have backslid since they... And what made you do that? What caused you to trip? What caused you to stumble? And so we're gonna, I'm going to be covering some things with you tonight. You know, we're in this world of trip hazards that we're in to, to get us to thinking how to avoid those things, how to overcome those things. I have tripped and caught myself. You know, that's a good day. It's when you trip and you fall flat on your face that, you know, I, I was thinking about this and meditating on it. Uh, of all the adversity that we face, 
Now, our men's group coming up is a different theme. It's about how to overcome adversity. And the speakers are going to be uh, focusing on some of those things and how to do that. And, and listen, we have a lot of uh, adversity. Listen, I discovered the tripping over the cord was not the adversity. It was hitting my face that was the adversity. Okay? <laughs> And so I try to catch myself before I fall flat on my face. And there's just some of these spiritual principles that parallel even the natural realm. And we got to learn about that, right? And how to overcome those things. Now here in 2 Peter, the, the first chapter, I want to take you here and just pull out a few things as we cover some of the Scripture tonight. And, and here in verse 4, I love, I love this whole passage of Scripture, this chapter even. Whereby are given to us, verse 4, uh, uh, and to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, by these what? These promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature. That's like when you speak into that mirror, you've got to see yourself as better, much more. And as a Christian, God wants us to be walking in His divine nature. And how do we get there? It's through these promises that you might be partakers of this divine nature, having already, having escaped, the corruption that is in the world through lust. You have, you have escaped it. You're alive inside. Your spirit's alive unto God. Maybe you didn't know that. Maybe you need to find out who you are. You have escaped this corruption, and you're not going to die. Your body may quit, but you're not going to die. Oh, glory to God. But listen, I want to experience His divine nature in this world, in my walk. I want to walk like what's on the inside. Well, let's go on. Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, and, and uh, uh, knowledge, where am I? And this, this pulpit's tilted. Let me get down here like, okay. <laughs> Y'all pull one on me there. Okay. Add to your virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience. Patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity, or the God kind of love. Verse 8, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind, cannot see afar off, and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Look at verse 10. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give all diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. The Amplified says you'll never stumble or fall. Now that really jumps out at me. When we're talking about trip hazards of the world, trip hazards of our spiritual walk, Listen, I don't want to be stumbling around. I don't want to be falling. How do I not do that? How do I recognize that? How do I be more than that and better than that? And it says, if you'll do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, here he's saying there will be some who are ushered in in abundance into the everlasting kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. If some are making it in abundance, I guess there's some that just making it in by the skin of their teeth right? I want to make it in with abundance. I mean, skin of the teeth is okay. I'd be glad for that, but I want to make it in, in abundance. So it says, for if you do these things, verse 10, you shall never fall. Now, when you read that, you've got to say, man, what kind of person do I have to be to not stumble or not fall, not to trip, not to, to flail around? And listen, in this world of of hazards and these trip hazards, listen, the question we got to ask ourselves is, can I be that kind of person? Can I be that kind of person? And I'm, I'm so encouraged by the Holy Spirit bringing out that word for those of you that stood tonight, that you're better than that. that God, he's saying you're more than what you're looking at. You're more than what you're seeing. Even in the mirror, you're more than that. Yeah, I can be that kind of person. So when it says about experiencing the everlasting kingdom of God, we've got to realize a couple of things. Bottom line, bottom line, God's word is true. You have got to solidify that in your heart. God's Word is true. It doesn't matter what you see. It doesn't matter what you're experiencing because your senses will lie to you. But God's Word is true. And you're going to have to get that before you can move forward. And listen, another thing, we're going to go to Hebrews 11 chapter. You're never going to progress unless you do something with what you have right now. You've got to do something with what you have right now so that you can progress in the Lord. Amen. You can't, I was reminded of an old term we used to, to, to use. You can't just sit there like a pew potato and expect to grow in the Lord. I don't know if that even applies good. Potatoes grow. But anyway, 
some of us, we sit around thinking, just going to act like a pew potato. I'm good right here. I'm not going to do anything. I'll just sit right here. But man, you've got to do something with what you got. Those of you tonight, as the Lord gave you that word, you need, to, you need to stand on that. You need to act on that and let God work in your life tonight. So it doesn't matter what your background is. Faith is the basis for our whole Christian walk. It is the common denominator with all of us, this level of faith. This thing that you start with. How many gave these, these steps? Faith and knowledge, knowledge, you know, uh, p- patience and temperance and all these godliness and brotherly kindness all the way up to the God kind of love. But it starts with faith. And we all have to start somewhere, and that's faith is a common denominator for all of us. And listen, I'm telling you here tonight, you may say, man, I don't have much faith. But if you're a Christian, if you have called on the name of the Lord, you have faith. Amen. You have a level of faith that can grow in your life. That can increase. Listen, when you talk about real Bible faith, real Bible faith simply says about you what the Bible says about you. In your, in your physical body, in your mental state, in your emotions, all these different areas, your spiritually, physically, it says, you know, the Bible has something to say about every one of those areas. And if you're going to walk in faith, you need to get your faith, your words lined up with what the Bible says about you. Amen? Anyone and everyone can have, have faith. Now listen, we're going to... In Hebrews there, it says, He who comes unto God must believe that He is. Now that, at first, could kind of throw you. When you, it says cometh, the cometh there, the word means approaches, worships, draw near, motion towards, ascension to. And, but it says the man who comes unto God must believe that he is. I thought, that doesn't make sense. Why you, would you be coming to God if you didn't believe that he is? Yeah. Are y'all with me on that thought process? Yeah. And I thought, wow, you know, how many of us go to God and we truly don't believe the fullness of who God is? And what he says that is true. And to me, that, see, that seems like an oxymoron. It's a contradictory of terms. But see, so many, much of us approach God not believing in what He says. What, now listen, what would be the symptoms of a person who is, is not believing that God exists? And you can see this all the time. One, I think it's so evident, is Christians who call themselves Christians and they believe in evolution. Hello. There's, I've, I've met people that doesn't believe that there's a literal hell. And they say, yeah, I'm a Christian. But there's no real hell. That's figurative. If there's a real heaven, there's a real hell. Because God said so. It's basically not believing God's Word, even about yourself. And what I want to do tonight is talk to you about adversity and challenges. And one thing that I want to tell you, and I'll, I'll tell you this till the day I go home. Listen, God's got a plan for your life. I don't know you. I don't know you, but it's not about you. It's about the kingdom. And I'm telling you, God's got a plan for your life. And it doesn't matter that you got over 60 now. It doesn't matter that you're drawing Social Security now. God's got a plan for your life. Amen? God's got a plan for your life. Let's go to, let's go to Acts, the, the 14th chapter. This is Paul and Barnabas. And when they were come, they had gathered a church together, and they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how He had opened the door of faith Unto the Gentiles. So Paul and Barnabas said, listen, God's done a great thing. He's not only extending the word, His word to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. He opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. You know what that's saying? He opened the door of faith to you and me. Oh, praise God. So the word of God has come to us and the door is open. And the only question is, are we going to step through it? Are we going to step through the door that God has made available to us? And what are you going to do with that door? Acts the 15th chapter. You're going to ask you why. why. Why has God opened that door? Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles. What? To take out of them a people for His name. God's one of people that will follow Him. A people who will live for Him. Be strong and have a good courage and follow God. And God's looking to you to be that kind of person. Are you all with me? Every, kind, every one of us in. And here's the question. Will it be you? Will it be you? Let me tell you a scripture about you and tell you something about you in Ephesians, the third chapter. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask a thing, according to the power that works in us, 
Unto Him be glory by the church, by Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Now you've heard this before. You've read this scripture probably before. And the NLT says, Now glory be to God by His mighty power at work within us. And the next phrase is the one I want to look at. It says, He is able to accomplish. God is able to accomplish. He's talking about you. He's able to accomplish infinitely more than we could ever dare ask. See, by the mighty power that's on the work, is at work on the inside of you. Now, the reason I think that God gave me this is that there's some people that sit in a service today and they come to church and they dress up good. They look good. They may be in a three-piece suit. If I could still fit in those, I'd have them here tonight, you know. <laughs> but there's people that come to church all the time in all sincerity, in their heart, they think they're too far gone. They think they're too far gone. There was a time that I thought of the Lord. I said, Lord, I, I want to be doing more. I want, to, I want to be better than this. I want to you know, accomplish more. And I read the scripture about King David, and David wasn't allowed to build the temple. Why? Because he had too much blood on his hands. And I thought, Lord, I want to, I want to do more. I want to accomplish. Do I have too much blood on my hands? But the Lord has forgiven me, and He's cleansed me. And He's doing that with you. Listen, I don't care where you are, what you've done, you're not too far gone that the Holy Spirit is not reaching out to you to draw you closer to the Father. It says He can accomplish so much more in your life. God can do that in your life. God is able to do something with you. Now let's go to Joshua, the first chapter. Joshua, the first chapter. Because there's a work, there's a power on the inside of you, working on the inside of you. All you got to do is learn how to tap into it. You hang around here long enough, you're going to learn how. <laughs> it's like kind of when you come to Victor Life, you hang around here long enough, somebody's going to hug your neck. <laughs> you hang around here long enough, you're going to get the Word of God on the inside of you, because that's what's going forth from here. Joshua 1, look at verse 1. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it, it, it came to pass that the Lord spake to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. I thought, oh my word, wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> right now, Lord, just give me an hour. Just give me an hour. I can walk a long ways an hour around here. Land is worth a lot of money around here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, actually, a land of milk and honey. Uh, can you imagine what he thought about that? And the Lord said, hey, wherever you put your foot, wherever you walk, that's yours. Can you imagine what welled up on the inside of him? Woo-hoo, woo-hoo. Yeah, Texas, woo-hoo, wasn't it? He didn't even know Texas in, but it, woo, it's somewhere. Okay. He said, listen, you can, this land's going to be yours. Look at verse 4. And he begins to explain. Look, jump to verse 5. There shall not be any man, not be any man, be able to stand before thee all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Now look at verse 6. Then he begins to lay out some things that he's going to be facing. And he starts off, he says, Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and thou mayest, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Do not be afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. See, that's God's promise. God's promise to him was this, everywhere you put the sole of your foot and tread upon, I have given to you as I did to Moses. I thought, oh my word. Did you notice that the land was given to Moses, but they didn't go in? They didn't go in and possess that? It was open to them. And I, I, I think that Lord, the Lord has given us the abundant life, but we must go in. He told Joshua, get up and go in. It was given to Moses. He messed up and didn't get in there. I thought, wow, we've got to go in and possess the land. If the door of faith has been opened to us, it's up to us to stand up and go in through that door of faith and receive what God has for us. 
to prosper in the land. I believe that God wants us to, to prosper right here where you are. God wants you to prosper right where you are. Amen. I was thinking, Kathy and I, Kathy's a realtor, so we were, yesterday was her birthday, so we went out to dinner and went to a movie. And before we made it to the movies, we went to this little area back over in south of, is it Sugar's? No. Shulman's. Okay. Shulman's or Shulman's? The movie house on that end. (laughs) On the other side, down there on the east side, it's amazing how much building is going on in there. So we were driving in and around there. They were, they, that's going to be quite a complex back there. And I thought, I thought there's, going, there's a lot of people <laughs> making a lot of money doing this. And I thought, you know, if, if we were talking about someone that we knew, if they were up here working right now, their skills in carpentry and, and all that they do, man, they could do good at that. And I thought about there's some people that would move to Sherman, move to Sherman and say, man, things are busting loose. But that doesn't guarantee that they're going to prosper till they get up and go in, till they put their hand to it. And I, I was thinking about, listen, uh, I was out in Pecos a few years back, uh, came through Pecos. Anybody know where Pecos is? It's not Picos, it's Pecos, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the home of the first rodeo, Pecos, Texas. I married the rodeo queen. <laughs> she was. Yeah, I feel good about that. Um, <laughs> So I married the cheerleader. I married the rodeo queen. Well, where was I going with that? Anyway, we, we came through there when the oil field was busting loose. I mean, it was amazing what was going on. It's like you, you look in the movies, like the gold rush days. And I thought, man, if somebody out here doesn't have a job, it's because they don't want a job. And it makes me think about Sherman. If you're capable of working and you don't have a job, it's because you don't want a job. Is that so bold? Because I've got, I've got business owners asking me all the time. They need people that can work for them, people with integrity, people that aren't afraid to work, people that know how to work. And, and, I, and they're crying out for help. And I think, man, Lord, that there's a lot of people that are just still out here not doing anything. Well, I thought about that in church, and I, I thought about going over to church and prospering in the land. Cause, and I thought, can you go into, can you move to Sherman and not prosper? Yes. Can we attend church and not get anything out of it? Yes. yes. Man, can we be a member of a church and not get anything out of it and grow? Yes. The answer is yes. That means we've got to rise up and go in and possess our land and be blessed of the Lord. Amen. To walk in faith and trust God. Now in this passage, uh, in Joshua, God introduced the virtue of courage. Courage, I believe, is a part of our character. And if we're going to grow in character, we've got, to, we've got to grow and be courageous in our walk. In Joshua 1 there in verse 8, he said, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou, uh, that thou mightest meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. What I want to bring out about that is the prosperity of Israel was in their hands. It was in their hands to do. If they would do what God said. Now see, in in that passage, He told them to be strong and of a good courage in three different areas. One, He said, you're going to go out here and you're going to have to divide all this land up with these people. So you've got to be strong and of a good courage. And secondly, you're going to have to walk according to the Word. You're going to have to follow My Word. You're going to be strong and of good courage to do what My Word says. How many of you found that so true? Walking according to the Word of God. And thirdly, he said, I'm going to be with you, and you've got to be strong and have a good courage about anything else that comes against you. Because there's things that come against us. And we've got to be strong and have a good courage. So God's going to take care of all that if we will do that. But we've got to rise and go in and possess the land. And I think that he's laid out a blueprint for our prosperity in those Scriptures. The principles work. Amen? And clearly, I think, I think what I see here is that courage is an issue of our possessing the land of abundance. To be courageous. To be courage in what we, courageous in what we do. And listen, did you notice that cur- being courage, courageous, having courage, being courageous, is not a suggestion, it's a command. Now, the question is, do you take it as God telling you, you need to be courageous? You're going to have some, have some gumption to you. You're going to have to have some grit to you. Now, see, for a man to say, men... I don't, I don't know, I guess the women are the same way, but men, 
That speaks something to us. We men, we need to be men. We need to be men with courage and valor and strength and grit. And that's what God's saying. Be courageous. Be strong. And it's not a suggestion. It's a command of God because these things God wants to accomplish in our life. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's the management of fear. I've watched enough TV to know that. How about (laughs) y'all? And I've experienced a few things. And I, I really believe this. I believe that everybody faces some type of fear at one point or another in their life. Everybody in this room, you have faced fear in some form in your life. It could be the fear of rejection. It could be the fear of failure. It could be fear of saying or doing the wrong thing. How many of you put your foot in your mouth and you're afraid to do that again? <laughs> you know, some of you, unfortunately, you're afraid of what people think. I've been guilty of that. Are y'all with me? Afraid of taking risks, and on and on we go. On and on we go. And I really do. I believe that fear is stopping a lot of Christians from receiving the blessings of the Lord. Amen. Now listen, let me give you, I've just got a few more things. Some areas that you need to be courageous in. And I will always be encouraging this, and it seems like I'm just, I feel like Jacob up here driving it home. Because I've said this so many times. We need to be courageous in our personal examination. To look at our own hearts. To examine our own hearts. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, that how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? <laughs> Don't you remember who you are? That Christ is on the inside of you? You're not a reprobate, are you? You're not a lost person. You're not a heathen, are you? Well, you might act like a heathen, but you're not. You're, you're born again. <laughs> Don't you know that? Can't you remember that? Examine your heart. Look at your own heart. Listen, you know when you're examining your heart, here we need to examine our heart in light of God's Word. If you're going to look at yourself, do it in light of God's Word. What God's Word says about you. Listen, if I, if I need my piano tuned, I don't call an auto mechanic to tune my piano. <laughs> and I don't ask that piano tuner to go fix my car. And if I want to know how to fix me spiritually, I'm going to go to God, not to the world. The world has no idea how to fix me. Amen. Quit listening to the world. You've got to examine your heart and prove your own selves in light of God's Word. Prove yourself in light of the Word of God. What does God's Word say about you? Oh, glory to God. Philippians 2.12 Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What does it take? It takes courage. It takes courage to examine yourself and be honest with yourself and with God. It takes courage to look in that mirror. (laughs) Oh, man, because you ain't going to like what you see at first. Are you all with me? Amen. You haven't tuned your eyes to see within and see the heart of you. To see what God sees. You see the outside. You see the ugliness. You see the dark side. Man, you've got to have courage to examine your own heart. I mean, the Lord will bring things up to you. And, I, and listen, he, <clears throat> he, He's still working on me. It's been a while back, but man, I had, I had an art, heart issue. <laughs> and uh, man, and I hate to admit this, but you know, we can cut this out of the video maybe, or I don't know, but no. Nah. But you may be like me. There's times when you want to forgive, but man, you are so mad at that person. You want to hate that person. You with me? You want to hate that person. And you know they got born again. That's what makes it worse. <laughs> and the Lord took me to a scripture in 1 John, the second chapter, and, and I'll just paraphrase this to save time. Verse, if you're writing down notes, verses 9 through 12, he talked about, listen, if you... If you hate your brother and you know he's a Christian, you call yourself a Christian, you hate your brother, there's darkness here. Darkness gets in your heart. And what that darkness will do is cause you to stumble. And it will cause others to stumble. Are you with me? Because of that darkness in your heart. And you say that you hate your brother when they're a Christian, darkness filters into our heart. And listen, it takes a lot to look at that and say, you're right, Lord. 
And then what really helped me is toward the end of the verse, in verse 12, where he talked about, but I have forgiven you. And, and I thought, man, Lord, you have forgiven me of so much. And here I'm acting like this. And the fact of it is, you're probably going to have to forgive me of a whole lot more. So I better get my heart right. <laughs> Are y'all with me? You've got to examine your... And you know, that takes courage. Are y'all with me? Because you may be that person who said, yeah, I want to hate them. Ooh, boy, they need it, Lord. They need to... You need to jerk slack out of them, Lord. And it's not right. You've got to look at your heart. You've got to humble your heart before the Lord. Amen? And in, in uh, James 4.10, it says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Now, the one thing about that verse I want you to notice, our job is to humble ourselves. It's God's job to lift us up. It's not God's job to humble you. <laughs> Nor is it your deacon board. Okay, I heard a couple of denominationalists in here. <laughs> Some background. You remember that old saying? It's not God's job to humble you. It's, a, it's your job to humble yourself. And then God will lift you up. Oh, praise God. Three things that can help us in this process. We've got to be honest with ourselves. You know you better than anybody knows you, right? Amen? You've got to be honest with yourself. And you've got to learn to be repentant in your shortcoming. And say, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry. Man, that brings back the word at the start of the service. Because you have the, you have the right intentions in your heart, but you find yourself not doing it. Right? And, and, and we've all done it, probably. And you've got to take responsibility in your mistakes. Take responsibility. Man up. Woman up. <laughs> take responsibility and have courage. And you've got to have courage in your relationships. And I... I'm not going to have time to go through all of that tonight, but you've got to have... Listen, uh, it's important that we exercise courage in our personal relationships and be honest with them. One, it takes a lot of courage to be married. <laughs> and I ain't going there. Okay, come on. No, it does. It takes a lot of courage to man up and love your wife as Christ loved the church and swallow your pride and your selfishness and love that other person regardless of what they say or do, or not that they did say anything wrong. Are you with me? That takes a lot of courage. And women, it takes a lot of courage for you to fulfill the Word of God and submit to your husband. You're saying, if he'd give me something to submit to, I'd submit to it. <laughs> but Lord, you got to just keep working on him. But it, you know, it takes courage to open up your heart to another person in such intimacy and share your heart and build a life together. Kathy and I have built a life together 47 years. But that took a lot of courage for both of us and a lot of strength, a lot of love, and a lot of God taking us by the hand. And you've got to have courage in your parental uh, parentage to be a parent. It takes a lot of courage, doesn't it? Yeah. Amen. It takes a lot of courage to raise those kids and, and to commit to that and be consistent with it and dedicated to it and sacrificially dedicated to it. It takes a lot of courage to do that and raise them in a world of darkness to see so they see light. And it also takes courage in friendships. You know, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. True friends tell us what we need to know, not what we want to hear, right? And true friends will keep us from destroying our lives. Amen. We've got to have the courage to be a true friend. Are you with me? To be a true friend. And if you'll show yourself friendly, you're going to have friends. Now, I'm going to go through a couple more scriptures here as I start to wind this down. Now, I'm going to say this. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say it because of one scripture in Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter. And then maybe another way, in case it offends you. <laughs> in case you're, you know, you're... Uh, no, I'll not say that because I know that would offend you. So, <laughs> I think God will test and prove His children. Now, let me put it another way. If that offends your doctrine... God will allow you to be tested and proven. And I, I can agree with that because He don't have to put nothing on us. There's enough running out there right now. Get on us if He just backs up a little bit, okay? And allow you to be tested. In Deuteronomy 8, chapter, look at verse 16. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known. Two, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. 
Can you imagine eating manna every day? What is that going to bring about? Humility, patience, trust, a lot of things. He said, I'm, I'm allowing you to be tested here. I'm going to let to put you through it so that you can, you might go well, it might go well with you in the end. See, God knows what's down the road. You don't always know it. Are you all with me? Verse 17, you may say to yourself, my power, my strength, of the strength of my hands has produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God. It is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And, confirms, and so confirms His covenant, which He swore to your forefathers as it is today. See, listen, God gives us a chance to see if we're going to be faithful to Him. God will give you a chance to see if you will be faithful to Him. Faithful in your family, faithful in your church, faithful in your finances, faithful in your walk. God will give you an opportunity to do that. You know, Joseph's experience in Egypt, God allowed Joseph to go through such great trials. But boy, did he get a good attitude. Amen? And you know, I think about that. I think God, you know, God tried Joseph. And so what was in his heart to see if he would obey God. I know God knew what was in his heart. The thing is, Joseph needed to know what was in his heart. I'm telling you, God knows your heart. He knows what's in there. Do you know what's in there? Do you know whether you have the strength to follow God? Do you know that you have the strength to stand against the wiles of the devil? To stand against adversity and challenges? And all of these trials that come our way. Do you know what's on the inside of you? See, I believe God allowed him to do that so he could see what's on the inside. That I'll follow God. In James, the fourth chapter, a couple more scriptures and I'll close. James, the first chapter. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. Count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That you may be perfect, meaning mature, entire, wanting, lacking nothing. Don't you want to be at that place where you, you're mature and you got everything and you don't lack anything? Okay, there's four of you. I, I, I want to be there. Do you know there's no other way to get there except through patience? What he's talking about here... There's no other way to get there but through patience, which comes from the challenges that come your way, the temptations, the trials. Are you with me? And he said, man, when you go through these temptations, know this, the trying of your faith is going to work patience. It's going to develop something into you. It's going to develop a good thing on the inside of you. And I was looking at that with the temptations. Listen, the tripping, the stumbling, that's not the adversity. The adversity is when I hit the ground, bust my nose. These temptations, that's not the adversity. That's the trip hazards that Satan's trying to throw up in front of you. It's when you succumb to it and you yield to it comes the adversity. You just got to know the difference. You got to realize the difference. You got to see the difference. Are y'all with me? See it when it comes your way. I don't have to trip. I don't have to fall. I don't have to succumb to that temptation. Glory to God, because I'm going to walk in perfection. I'm going to overcome. Amen. Oh, praise God. <laughs> it's only through the trials and testings that we, we find out what we're really made out of. Amen. Okay, I see some of you not getting that. Um, early on, and I'm almost through here, really. I'm going to make it on time tonight, okay? And uh, <laughs> glory to God. <laughs> It's only through trials and challenges that we find out what we're really made out of. You know, it's a good thing when you look back on your life and see where you've come and grown. Amen. There is nothing wrong with that. I had a challenge a few years back. It's been a few years. I don't 12, 14 years. If I'd have been the old guy, if it had been a little further back, <laughs> it'd have been a different story. Boy, this situation, I just want to go pounce somebody. Forgive me. Not all pastors are perfect like Pastor Austin. I know. We're not all nice guys, okay? <laughs> and he is a nice guy. 
<laughs> Some of us were rounders like Pastor Terry. And uh, so... <laughs> But you know, in the situation, I was pastoring. And I was pastoring in Brownwood. And this situation came up and it challenged me. It was a temptation. But you know what? My thought was, you know what? I've got 600 people here that are counting on me. I can't do that. I've got to release that to the Lord. And then I was so thankful to look at that situation and think, you know what? I'm not the same man anymore. Thank you, Jesus. I am not the same man as I was 20 years previous. Praise God. I'm so grateful. And you need to be seeing that in your own life. Last scripture, Isaiah 48, verse 17. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. The word here, profit, is to be valuable and useful, beneficial. It's the Lord our God that teaches us how to be worth something. Yeah, and the first time I read that, I thought, well, what's the opposite? I'm not worth anything without Him. But see, God teaches me to be beneficial. God teaches me to be worth something. And listen, the one thing, that the phrase that I want you to think about tonight, with all this I'm talking to you about and all the trials that come, listen, it matters how we go through the fire. See, our focus this coming weekend, not this Saturday or the next, of overcoming adversity, you know, so much of the time, I, I don't want to hear that you're going through the same thing I went through. I want to know how you got through it. I, I want to know, how do I get out of this? When I find myself going through the fire, I, I don't need to stop. I need to get through it. But it does matter how you act in the fire. Amen? Amen? That matters so much. And then tonight, if, are you going through a trial? I mean, the question is, are you passing the test? Are you passing the test? And my one thing to, to share with you is, listen, stay the course. Keep the faith. God is faithful. See the big picture of what's going on. Stay the course. Don't let the devil have any challenges, or win any challenges in your life. And one thing that I want to say is, in this last, and I, I, I'm closing, promise, my second closing, <laughs> second and final closing. My youngest son, he's, he's kind of, he's funny, he's hilarious at times, but he sometimes has kind of a bold way of looking at things, and he said to me one time, he said, nobody's getting out of this life alive, so act accordingly. <laughs> I said, you got that right. <laughs> I thought just old folks said that stuff. (laughs) But here's the other thing. None of us are immune to adversity. Act accordingly. None of us are immune to adversity. Let's act accordingly.